How many's got your Bibles? Let me see those, please. Hold them high. Well done. Electronic Bibles, can I see those, please? Well done. Good job. Um, how many of you have noticed that the seats were arranged, arranged differently? How many did not notice? I see some of y'all going. <laughs> um, so uh, he's not here tonight, but I'll give credit to Jim Reynolds for the idea. He was the one that told us how to split, put two rows in, and that we could fit more chairs in than we did previously when we had the one aisle. And so we did that, and I noticed as people would come in, especially on Sundays, it's not as bad on Thursday nights, but especially on Sundays, you have a family of four that comes in, and you got three seats available on the side, there's one man out. And so I thought, well, Jim, you're, you're probably right about that. So we, we decided to make that four on each side, which shrank the little one, or the, the, the larger row, into a little bit smaller one, into six. And then in an effort to... Uh, see, the reason we had the bigger aisles in eight is if somebody's got to go to the bathroom or something, you're trying to, but when you only have six, you're only, you're only going across, you know, two chairs, even if you're sitting in the middle. So we measured it out, and Joe Michael was key in that, Nicholas was key in that, Jim Nowicki, who's not here tonight, he, he's ill tonight, y'all pray for him, was key in that, and uh, so if you see the blue tape on the baseboards on the side, leave it alone. Okay, because that's how we measure where the, where the uh, chairs go. But right now, if you count the two in the sound booth, we have uh, 160 chairs on the floor. And so that buys us just a little bit more time before we got to bounce to the gym or find another spot. So um, that's, that's really going to really help things. So how many of you feel like you're too close to the row in front of you? Good deal. Because the alternative was if you're too close, you have to take the front row because then there's nobody. <laughs> so that was good. Good deal. Okay. So how many has a clue when you saw that graphic? Firefox. Now, what in the world is he going to talk about? My goodness. Uh, sometimes you guys can guess where I'm going. I'm not sure you can, you can really guess where I'm going tonight. So there's... If I were to pick two of the least preached from books of the Bible, I would probably say that at number two, it'd be Revelation. Partly because there's such a variance on beliefs as to what it means. Uh, and how to lay out end time events. And so many times I think it's overlooked just because it's, it's controversial. Um, but probably the number one book of the Bible that is least preached from, in my opinion, is the Song of Solomon. How many ever read the Song of Solomon? How many didn't know the Song of Solomon was in the Bible? Okay. So just the mention of that book to any religious clan can make them blush, turn three shades of pink, and shy away from any discussion about it because it is the record of a love affair of King Solomon with a Shunammite maiden. It's a, it's a romance novel that might find its way to the cheesy romance novel aisle in Walmart. And... Um, Oddly enough, I'm going to pull a passage from Song of Solomon tonight. In the midst of this book, there's a strange verse, but it teaches an important principle of excellence in church ministry. If a church is seen as healthy, it's also described as a growing church. Okay? Health is not just maintained. Health grows, okay? And so I don't know how many times, for those of you that stick around after we've concluded, we typically have some, some sort of a pre-glow, then the message, and then I'll sign off online, and then we do what we call an afterglow. And then when that's over, then, um, then I release you to go. 
and about a third of the congregation seems to not have any place to go. And so they find themselves, you know, visiting and praying for each other, hanging out in the lobby or getting coffee or shooting hoop in the gym and all this kind of stuff. And I don't know how many times I've looked around and I've commented to whoever might be in my proximity and say, I want you to look around. They, they see all these people sitting around and talking. And I mean, the, the music is kind of background noise and there's so much conversation going on. And I said, this is a sign of health. Do you know how many places that you go um, for worship and for teaching and the moment the benediction is given, I mean, there's smoke where they were. The parking lot is empty. You know what I'm saying? Um, I have to kick people out. I'll tell them, listen, you do, not have to go, you do not have to go home, but you cannot stay here. You know what I'm saying? I got to go eat. And, um, and so I, I believe that that really is a sign of health, that you're wanting to be here, that you want to hang out, that you want a fellowship, that you want to pray for people, that you want to build a relationship. All those things are a sign of health and growth. There are many expressions of God's people, which is the church, and we're described in Scripture in certain reference uh, places to plants or trees. In John 15, 5, Jesus describes himself as the vine and calls us the branches. So in John 15, 5, it says, I am the vine, you are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. Now, I know I've preached that message before. How many's ever cut the head of a, uh, off of a snake? How many's never done that? I don't know why I'm saying this, but it's for somebody. When you cut the head off of a snake, now let's 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 pick a viper that has the potential to kill us, right? So a copperhead, a rattlesnake, a uh, black mamba. I mean, use your imagination, okay? So if you cut the head off. There, oh God, this is, whoo, I did not know I was going here. There are still reflexes. And that snake body will still do this, and you'll think, I just killed you! But it's still, it's moving around, right? And that mouth will still. I saw one video where the head was severed from the snake, and, and the, the body of the snake came around the mouth, and it bit itself. Now watch this. Apart from me, you can do nothing, right? So you have a lot of people that got connected to Jesus, and somewhere along the line, life happened, and they got severed from him. But they look like they have life, and their mouth is still moving. And from all appearances, it looks like that they're still active when they can do nothing. We have to stay, watch this, not just connected to, but grafted in the vine. Okay? So that, do you understand what grafting is? Have you ever seen like a peach branch that's been grafted into an apple tree? You ever seen that? So they cut a V into the branch, and they cut a point into the, into the smaller branch, and they stab that, that, that point into the V, and then they tape it all up and everything, you know, and before long, you got peaches growing off an apple tree, and before long, they start kind of culminating, and now you got a peach apple or an apple peach. You, know, you, you catch what I'm saying? And so God needs us, and we need him, so we have to be grafted into that vine. He's not trying to change who we are. He's trying to bring out who we are that we don't know who we are yet. See, there's so many people saying, well, I, you know, I don't need to come to God because, bless God, I'm created like this. And da, da, da. You don't think God knew that? That's why Psalm 139 says that God knit you together in your mother's womb. So when he did that, that's like grandma making a recipe. You know what I'm saying? She's baking a cake. She's got X amount of flour, X amount of eggs, X amount of vanilla and all this. You go, wait, wait, I got to write that down. How much is it? Oh, it's just a dash of this and a, a little bit of this. And so she's making that, right? So you were created as a recipe of God. So when he was putting stuff in there, he might have put a little prophet in here, a little teacher in there, 
a little grace and mercy in here, and you mix that one up. Because you are a particular recipe and combination that nobody else is. You might have some similarities, but you are not the identical of anybody else. And our life is discovering what he put on the inside. When my kids were young, we used to buy these little games. And it was kind of an excavator kind of, uh, not excavator, but geologist kind of thing where you buy this block of, of dirt and they put fake gems in there. So they got a little shovel and a little hammer and a little pickaxe and you have to break stuff because you don't want to break the gem that's in there, but you want to go through and discover what's on the inside. You find, you know, it's a piece of junk, purple piece of plastic nut, right? But it was exciting to, right, but on the inside of us. And so we have to dig. You know what happens when you dig in something? You're, you're tearing up what is stationary. How many ever had to plow dirt? That ain't fun. Now watch this. In this room, I'm the farmer. And in order to plant seed, many times I have to plow. And when I have to plow, some of y'all be saying, ow, that hurts. Quit messing with that. That was fine just like it was. I liked it. <laughs> right? So I'm having to plow through there to turn the soil so I can drop a seed in that will be deep enough that it will take root. Because if all I do is just sling and say, it's on you, a lot of times it's going to fall on stony and, and hard and, and impenetrable ground and all that kind of stuff. It's just going to get washed away or picked off by the enemy. So that's why sometimes you guys leave angry at me. I used to say even long before I was ever a pastor, I said, if your pastor does not hack you off at least once every two or three months, he's probably not your pastor. And see, there, there's a great rotation because we got enough people here now that at least some of you, at any given point, will be kind to me. Two-thirds of you might be upset. <laughs> you know, yeah, but there's, all, there, there's, a, there's, a, there's a turnover. So at least we got some people that's, that's happy and loving on us. <laughs> that would be... A lot less fun if it weren't so true. So, he also in Scripture describes Israel as a fig tree. And God describes a righteous person as a tree of life. So in Psalm chapter 1, verse 1, Blessed is the one who does not walk in step with the wicked, or stand in the way that sinners take, or sit in the company of mockers, but whose delight is in the law of the Lord, and who meditates on his law day and night. That person is like a tree planted by streams of water which yield its fruit, watch this, in season, and whose leaf does not wither, whatever they do prospers. Can I just back up one line there? That person is like a tree planted by the streams of water which yields its fruit in season. <laughs> it's not my notes either. Yeah, that was not a Michael Jackson moment, whoever said that. So a tree is not producing fruit all the time. There are seasons of growth and there are seasons of fruit. So if you're looking at somebody's life, well, they just ain't producing. This might be their off season. Because sometimes you've got to take in nutrients. You know what I'm saying? You've got to grab some strength. You've got to grab some, some whatever, sustenance for yourself so that you can produce fruit. Because if there's nothing coming in, there can't be anything going out. But I, I want to tell you in the spirit, seasons are different. Just like right now. We're growing numerically in what other churches call the summer slump. When other churches are bottoming out, we're shooting up. Why? This is a different season. It's a season for this body, for this house, for, for these individuals. You catch what I'm saying? So you know what that tells me? All the seed that you've been planting all those years past, 
with all those people that said, no, I ain't going. I don't want your God. I don't want your Jesus. I don't want that church. That's a weird pastor. All he does is spit and scream. All those people, because you're seeing fruit, now's the time when you need to call them up and say, hey, what's up? What's up? Why? Because we're in a season right now of harvest. Y'all ain't hearing anything I'm saying. I'm, I'm trying to tell you, when you see fruit dropping in the house, Pay attention to that and go, ha, ah, what's dropping here because I'm in this house. I'm a part of this, this orchard. I'm a part of this body. If that's producing, then other seed that I produced elsewhere is probably producing now because this is my spirit. Y'all ain't catching this. Some of y'all gotten so discouraged. I've been witnessing to them for 10 years. I did. One of my friends that I did literally witness to for 10 years was here last Sunday and Monday night. Y'all ain't hear nothing. So I have, to, I have to know that God is looking for consistency. Uh, see, y'all gonna make me plow, I can tell you right now. <laughs> Growing plants such as vines seem to typify God's people. And their growth shows our growth. So Song of Solomon 2.15 says, Take us the foxes, the little foxes that spoil the vines, for our vines have tender grapes. Let me read from the NIV. Catch for us the foxes, the little foxes that ruin the vineyards, our vineyards that are in bloom. And in the message translation, I don't use it often, but I do. Then you must protect me from the foxes, foxes on the prowl, foxes who would like nothing better than to get into our flowering garden. Not long ago, I preached a message about Judas's in your life. If I were to marry two messages together, it'd be Firefox and Judas. Firefox and Judas. Because there is no such thing as an actual Firefox. You wear that? How many knew that? How many did not know that? How many didn't vote? I see hands going. It's not a trick question. This isn't really hard. So in that passage of Song of Solomon 2.15, catch for us the little foxes. The little foxes that ruin the vineyards, our vineyards that are in bloom. That Hebrew word for take is alkaz. And it literally means to seize or lay hold of. So what he's saying is get a hold of the little foxes, seize them, and catch them before they can damage the harvest that God intends to send. Why are you going to seize them? They have the ability and the capacity to destroy the fruit in your life. When something is alive, it can be vulnerable. Now, I like watching fights of big animals. Elephants, rhinos, I mean big animals. You know what I'm saying? I watched, this, I watched this one video, two oxen, and I'm telling you, when I say oxen, these suckers were huge, come running at each other, and they hit so hard that one of them flipped over the other and got up dazed like, what I just do, right? Um, and I watched some of these big crocodiles. Uh, and... I thought if, if a person was standing there, they would snap them in two, and they would be gone in just a matter of seconds. But yet they step on and walk on these rocks and these big stones, and they don't give it a second thought. Now, that may have never occurred to you. I know I'm weird. But listen to this. The crocodile is not going after the rock because it's no threat, it's dead, and it don't taste good. Huh? How many of you have had children? As soon as that baby popped out, 
And as soon as you got to have that first kiss and that first moment, and then family started coming to the room, what would you do? No, you did not. You can look. Stay away. You, you can look, right? Why? Because they're vulnerable. And that maternal or paternal instinct on the inside of you kicked in and said, they're, they're vulnerable. They're weak. You might not hold their head right. You might not turn them over. You, you might not hold them like I would hold. Y'all hearing anything I'm saying? They're very, very vulnerable. And so that's why we have to protect the children. How much so when you start producing fruit in God and those buds start to produce fruit and the foxes show up because they want an easy meal? Why do you think pastors are called shepherds? I might go buy me one of them high dollar walking sticks that are twisted, you know, whatever. Because there, there's sometimes I see some of y'all just do, come here, Frank. You know, just come on. Line up, buddy. You, you see what I'm saying? Why? We're shepherds. we got to beat off, watch, the wolves, the foxes. And it's amazing. I'm really going to say some stuff tonight. We may have to edit this really heavily. <laughs> I can tell who belongs to us and who we belong to in the room. You want to know why? Because when I say Frank... I see some foxes in your life. If all of a sudden you start, oh, them ain't foxes. Them's been my friends since 1970. Right? So if, if, if the warning that I'm giving and I'm saying I'm seeing by the Spirit that there are some real issues and you got some people that's about to devour you, if he just flat out ignores me, tosses it off the cuff, then I can know he's probably not mine and he about not to be anybody's. <laughs> you hear what I'm saying? But if I come to you and I say, listen, my heart is broken, and I don't even like saying this because I know what it's going to do to you, but I'm saying I'm seeing some foxes in your life. And you go just point them out. I don't beat them down. Why? Because you want to protect what God is doing in you. Y'all hear anything that I'm trying to tell you. So foxes show up for a free meal, a quick meal, a tasty meal, and one that they don't have to work for. You guys better hear what I'm saying. When there's growth, what is, what is a healthy church known as? As a growing church. As soon as there's new growth, expect foxes. Y'all ain't hearing nothing yet. Y'all being all holy. Oh, yes, Pastor. Mm, yeah. Oh, yes. Hallelujah. You ain't hearing me yet. When you see new growth... Expect foxes in the vines. And it's our job. I spoke pretty frankly to the men. How many of you men would say I was pretty direct? This last, this, yep. We have to police ourselves. And I'm going to tell you something about men. Men in this house. You better pay attention. Not all the men that show up to any given church are there for godly reasons. And you should not wait on a female to tell you I feel odd about that guy. Now, if she does, take it seriously. Just like if a little kid says, I feel unsure, unsafe, and take that seriously. But I told the men Monday night, I said, you got to police yourselves. Know them that labor among you. Know them. Where you hang your hat, where you work, how long you been there? What church did you come from before you got here? How long have you been saved and been knowing Jesus? How long have you been saved? How long, you spirit filled? Do you know you're spirit filled? Do you know how to know you're spirit filled? Are you married? You got kids? He said, Well, man, you just being all know. Listen, somebody that you don't know just walked up in your family. Are you working to not offend them? Or are you working to protect the house? Oh, I'm sorry. Did, did y'all need sugar smacks tonight? Is this not sweet enough? I think I've told you this story before. I'm going to tell you one more time. Years ago, 
My uncle was alive. He pastored a church in Austin, Texas, House of the Lord Fellowship Church. And I really learned a lot about helps ministry from going there. In fact, I learned so much. I came back to Oklahoma City, got my 50-passenger Bluebird bus, loaded it up with church folk, and drove them back to Austin to experience it. And so one of the things that their helps ministry is taught to do is to, to check out people that are coming in. Let me show you how that happens. Come here, Joseph. So Joseph's new. He's never been here before. Hey, man, my name's Joel. What's your name? Man, it's so good to see you. I'm glad you're here today, buddy. It's great, great to have you, man. I just checked him out. And y'all go, yeah, that's a, that's a little bit forward, but watch what happened. Thank you. A guy showed up one day, and they did that. And they felt the peace underneath the shirt. And watch this, not in the flesh, led of the Lord. Shoved that guy up into the wall and said, I'm going to tell you this one time. If you're here to harm my pastor, they will carry you out feet first. You understand what I'm saying? You find a seat, you sit down, and when that last amen's given, you get out. So good to have you, man. Go on ahead there. <laughs> they went in. They found a seat. They sat down. When everybody else was standing and clapping and rejoicing, they never moved. It's like he was frozen until that last amen was given. He got up and bolted. Do you know that they found out some weeks later? He was literally hired to do a hit on the pastor. Now, isn't that miraculous on the eve of a missed hit on former President Donald Trump. So you think that assassins are only after political figures? You think they're only after pastors? Why do you think there's so much sex trafficking? New fruit found by a fox. We got people so busy coming in trying, y'all just need to help me. My electric about to get shut off. I ain't eight in four days. I just need some help. And I'm not making light of that because there is some real need. But when everybody comes with this mentality to church, we miss the people that are there that act just like that. We don't know that they're not in that. Y'all ain't catching nothing. You say, man, this, this is a little bit heavy for a Thursday night church. I'm not sure all the people on Sunday can handle what I'm telling you right now. This is the real church that's here on Thursday. You hear what I'm saying? And if y'all are waiting on Rachel and I to find every plant in the house and take them out back and chop their heads off so that you guys can just live your life, then you're missing it. This is a family of God. We have a common enemy. His name is the devil. And he shows up in many forms. Oh, we've got to take the little foxes. Sometimes a fox can be or can be identified by attitudes. I don't This is so far off my notes. You have no understanding. When people come to this house specifically, and especially, and people are worshiping, they're lifting their hands, they're honoring God, and you see somebody that very clearly is not, they're just kind of like, huh? That's your first sign. Because if our purpose of coming together is first to honor God, and secondly to bless and encourage one another, and they don't seem to be into either one of those, it begs the question, wonder why they're here. Is this too practical? You, you catch what I'm saying? So if people are having a hard time, now listen, they can be bound up, they can have some issues, it might be difficult for them, they raise their hands. I mean, our people are like, whoa, you know, and so it might be a real culture shock for some people. You know, some might just kind of, <laughs> that's the best they can do. Hey, I'll honor that. You, you, you catch what I'm saying? But, but pay attention because I'm telling you the outward is an accurate reflection of the inward. 
as a man thinketh on the inside, so he is on the outside. So if I'm gritting my teeth and I'm snarling, that's a good indication of what's happening on the inside. A lot of people don't know what to do when the presence of God shows up. It's so foreign to them, they just, what is this, right? It's weird. I, I was there once, but God dealt with me and sucked me in, right? But pay attention because not everybody who's getting the eebie-jeebies is getting the eebie-jeebies because God's dealing with them. It could be the fact that they're being repelled by God. See, y'all want to look all holy right now. Foxes can be attitudes. They can be tricks of the enemy to, to hinder and stop growth. Foxes can be well-meaning decisions that produce hindrances rather than promotion. Here's one I know you're going to love and enjoy. Foxes can be relationships that we expected to be a blessing, but instead we found them to be a curse in our life. The Bible says very clearly, how can two walk together unless they be agreed? So the enemy of our souls, he does send foxes. I promise you, he sends foxes to hinder our growth. And as soon as things begin to move forward, the enemy sends out foxes. How many of you have ever said, well, listen, I didn't have all this trouble when I wasn't serving God, when I was just hanging out with the devil all the time. Ain't nothing bad happened in my life. Now, all of a sudden, I said yes to Jesus, and oh, my goodness, it's like all hell broke. Why is that? Because the moment you got it straight with Jesus and you positioned yourself to bear fruit, foxes were released. Why? He doesn't want you ever bearing fruit because if you ever find out what it's like to bear fruit, he knows he can't stop you. Y'all ain't hearing nothing I'm saying. He doesn't want you to experience bearing fruit because he knows that will be an addiction to you. And you find, oh my goodness, this is the bomb. Wow. God, you picked me to produce this. Ah. That's why I can't understand people that go to church. Kumbaya. You know? I don't get it. I want to celebrate who he is, who he made me to be, and what he called me to do. That's what everybody ought to be doing. One thing that proves things are going really well in your life is the presence of foxes. See, some of y'all been blaming God. God, if he's any kind of God, why has all these people come to devour me? He's like, because I'm so involved in your life and I'm so changing the course of your life that they smell new fruit coming. Remember last week we discussed another sign of possible promotion and increase. What is that? The arrival of Judas. Judas. Sometimes this can be evidenced by little squabbles within the body, little problems that arise between members. Sometimes it's imaginary. Listen, I know Cameron's mad at me. I seen him when I was preaching. He's kind of looked up and snarled a little bit. I mean, he don't talk to me. I, I just I know something's up over there. You've got to watch him. Ain't nothing going on. It's a figment of my imagination. Why? Sometimes my fear is played out in what I see happening to people. You know how many times I've had to sit down with somebody and say, listen, there ain't no problem here. The only problem is between your ears. You understand what I'm saying? we got to get that fixed. What's between your ears got to get fixed because you're seeing things that aren't real. You're making it up. Now watch this. What happens when you pretend? Ah! So all of a sudden, you act like there's a problem with Cameron, and where there wasn't a problem, now there is. Why? Because I pretended that there was, and the devil says, ah, that's an opening I can feel. Boom. You know, you know he's acting funny around you. <laughs> See, I just saw the light bulb going about six or seven, and you just went ding, ding, ding. Oh, my God. Oh. Right? <laughs> that's why if you think there's a problem, and he's going like this. Hey, man, I haven't seen you in a minute. Notice we haven't been talking a whole lot. We, are we good? And when he goes, eh, yeah, I knew it. I'm buying you dinner, and you're going to tell me what's up. 
You see what I'm saying? And if he goes, dude, what are you talking about? Man, the enemy must be messing with me because I thought sure as the world you was upset. I ain't upset at you, man. I've been wondering what's wrong with you. I've been wishing we could hang out, blah, 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 blah. Oh, relief, right? But you know what we don't do? We don't do that. We go like this. Do you see him talking to me like that? Do you see him looking at me like that? I know he's been upset at me. Did you see that too? You, you, did, you saw that, didn't you? And all of a sudden, here comes these foxes. Y'all catching anything? That's why we got to police each other. We got to shut this stuff down. And just so y'all know, I don't know of any issues in the church. I'm telling you this before I know of anything. So that nobody can say, I know why he preached that. And that. No, you don't. No, you don't. <laughs> Matthew chapter 16, verse 17. And Jesus answered him, Blessed are you, Simon bar Jonah, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. And I tell you, you are Peter. And on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom, and whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Catch what he said. I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Now watch this. He's the vine. We're the branches. And the devil knows the word, and he knows he can't kill the vine. So who are you going to go after if he can't kill the vine? How is he going to go after the branches? Get the fruit. Now watch this. Isn't this interesting? The Bible says that if we stop producing fruit, we'll be cut off and cast into the fire. You go, yeah, but I've been producing. It's just been getting stolen. <laughs> huh? That's why we have to police the foxes. So I hope you guys know me well enough to know that when I tell you, because I'm pretty transparent, I'm probably more transparent than, than I should have ought to be. But when I tell you that I found a fox in my life, there's a good indication that that fox is in your life. So when I sound the alarm, found a fox, found a fox, then everybody needs to be going through the vines. Oh, get out of here. Right? Why? Catch those suckers, round them up. And I know they can be. You know how I know? The Bible says that when Samson wanted to get back at the, at the enemy, he routed up 300 foxes. I've wondered about that. I can't catch one. He got 300. Come here, fox. Come here, fox. How? And then the Bible says he took a torch, took two foxes, put their tails together, tied their tails together, stuck a torch in there, lit it on fire, and sent, sent them through the barley fields of the enemy. I can't catch one fox. He got 300 and then tied them up together. That's a dude. The enemy knows he can't stop the vine, so he wants to stop you and I. So who pays the price? If you want to know the honest truth, who pays the price? The new person, the new believer, the new member, the one who's not strongly grafted in the vine, the one who's new to this walk of faith. That's why just like a baby, you don't have a one-month-old and walk in the bedroom, all right, sweetie, get up. Chores have got to get done. You'd never do that to a one-month-old. And yet somehow we think that that applies in the spirit, and it doesn't. We protect the vulnerable. I'm going to protect as much as I can, but you need to understand there's a lot more branches and a lot more foxes than what one dude can do by himself. Well, one dude and one dudette. Right? So when you find a fox 
and you know he's nibbling on your fruit. Don't be silent. Don't enable. Rat them out. Well, they might not want to be my friend no more. Hallelujah. When we have new believers, it's important that mature believers, guys, not, not believers that said they've been believers for 50 plus years. I've known of some believers that were six months older or more mature than believers that were believers for 50 years. We need mature believers to take these newbies under their wing and help them to identify what's good and appropriate and right and wrong and healthy and unhealthy. The enemy loves to work on new fruit, but he discourages those that have wisdom. Y'all need to listen very carefully. You're taking notes. He discourages those that have wisdom, discernment, and experience in life and in ministry. This is why the enemy wants to get the mature believers to believe the lie that they are not needed, they're not wanted, they're unnecessary. There's a reason why I don't let my kids go to the doctor alone. There's a reason why I make sure that if my kids have to sign a legal document, I read it. There's a reason why even our government says if you want to have a driver license, you first must have a permit. Why? Because when you have a permit, you can't drive an automobile without a licensed, qualified driver in the front seat with you to supervise you, to instruct you, to lead you, to caution you, to tell you what to do. Nicholas and I were on the interstate today, and I was grateful that I was driving because all of a sudden my lane backed up quick. I mean, we're clipping along, 65, 70 miles an hour, and all of a sudden, whoop, and I saw them starting to jagger and, and stack up. And so I, I pulled over onto the shoulder to give the people coming up behind me, A, notice that something's up or he wouldn't be on the shoulder, and B, to give them a little extra time before they had to impact the one in front of them. Y'all hear anything I'm saying? That comes from experience. Most people, especially if you're a new driver and you got that situation, you just stop and go, and you look in your rearview mirror, you grit your teeth, and you lock up right? There's some things that only come from experience. So I was glad he was in the vehicle to see what I did because I didn't have time to say, now son, the lane here is about to back up really fast and I'm not going to have time to tell you, so I'm going to warn you right now. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to yank off onto the shoulder, take the grass if I have to to get I didn't have time. I had to demonstrate it. That's what we as believers got to do. Sometimes you don't have to say, hey, there's, there's a fox right there. You just reach up, grab the fox, cut his throat, throw him away and say, do you see that? Be careful. You catch what I'm saying? This is what our job is to do with each other. Oh, you thought this is one of them churches you didn't do nothing. You just showed up and ate and drank and made messes and went home and came back next week and do it all over again. <laughs> oh. Unfortunately, too often, it's the young ones that pay the price. Same thing with sex trafficking. Listen, I know my kids are older. I know my son is just about as big as I am. But his age still makes him a target for sex trafficking. So you need to know that even though he's big for his age, when we go to Walmart, I tell him, you're nowhere. I don't have eyes on you, and you don't have eyes on me. You understand that? I know you're big, but you make sure I know where you're at. And it's your job to make sure that I know where you're at. Why? 
Because the devil is a thief. And he comes to kill, to steal, and to destroy. My job of protection is not over for him when, when he can tip the scales the way I do. I'm still responsible. What's our responsibility to new believers, to guests, to people that don't yet know Jesus but are kind of checking stuff out? What's our responsibility? Well, when the Lord gets a hold of their heart, he brought them to your doorstep. Talk about a hot lead. He brought them to the house. Why don't you love them so well that they see Jesus in you? Does that make sense? Okay, making tracks. Take the foxes, number one. Number two, we have to make a choice today to guard against the foxes. I'm certain that if we took a poll, which I'm not going to do, although things overall are happening very positively, there would be some that would say they don't enjoy some of the changes. Some of you might not like the fact that we just rearranged the chairs and put them a little closer together in order to get more people in here. You might not enjoy having less leg room. You might not enjoy now having four seats instead of three or six seats instead of eight. And you certainly may not enjoy the prospect of us talking about moving to the gymnasium. That just might make your skin crawl and your feathers go the wrong direction. But overall, there are sacrifices and adjustments that every one of us have got to make so that others can know who Jesus is. The right decisions many times are very difficult. Number three, how do we guard against the foxes? If you're not careful, you'll dismiss what I'm about to say because you'll say, I've heard this so many times before. That's the problem. We've heard it so many times before, but we never let it take root in our lives. How do we guard against the foxes? We've got to commit ourselves to prayer. Now watch this. I don't mean set the, the clock and then see how long you can talk. Thank him, praise him, give him your request, and then listen. Have a notepad. I don't know how many times people try to tell me, oh, I pray. Man, I pray all the time. I say, great. What's the last thing God told you? What do you mean? What do you mean what do I mean? <laughs> Prayer is a conversation, not a monologue. So either you've been babbling so much, God didn't get a word in edgewise, or you've been doing it wrong from the beginning and didn't know that prayer was two-way. you got to listen. You want to know why so many people are in marriage counseling today? Because they don't listen. They're experts at telling what they've done right and what the other person's done wrong, but they have not heard. They've not listened. That's why these counselors are making the big bucks. Because if I tell you, hey, quit it. Fine, we're just going to find us another pastor. He's going to let us. Fine, you go pay a counselor $300 an hour. He says, hey, quit it. You'll do that. Why? Because you paid them $300 an hour. I'm not charging enough. <laughs> so prayer. Also, the Word of God is our manual. The Word of God gives us instruction. You know how many times people ask me, so what do I do? And all I do as I tell them what the Word of God says we should do, how to love, how to walk, how to pray, how to seek God, how to pursue the things of God, how to get rid of habits, how, 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 how. This is the manual. It's all in here. The problem is it's an open book text or test, but people look at the size of the book. They get intimidated by the size of the book. Have you looked at your problems? Find the answer. And right now you got Google. Google, what does the Bible say about hating people? Google, what, is the, what does the Bible say uh, about marriage problems? Google, what does the Bible say about parenting skills? Google, watch this. 
God is so powerful, even AI has to tell you what the word says. Prayer, word of God. The Bible says that the enemy is like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. How many has ever played Mother May I? May indicates permission. We know the devil has the ability to wreak havoc in our life, but we either give or deny the permission for him to do that. So let me just say it like this. The devil may not devour me. The devil may not devour you. The devil may not devour no excuses. He does not have permission to do any of that. Why do you think we do deliverance and teach deliverance once if not twice a year? To teach you how to deny the devil access. To teach you how to remove permission that you ignorantly or on purpose at some point gave the devil access to your life. Too often we got people, well I bind you and I, I command you, you can't do this and you can't do that. Listen, tell your children only what they can't do and see what they do. You can't watch that show. You can't use an iPad. You can't have a cell phone. You can't go outside. You can't talk to your friends. You can't go to that party. You can't wear those clothes. You can't. Just tell them all the things they can't do and see what they do. At some point, you're going to deny them access to everything, and they're going to explode. They're not going to care what you said or did. They're going to do what they're going to do, right? So when you, it's important that you give the option. If you say you can't do this, tell them what they can do. I've been to somebody here recently. The devil is being obstinate. And I said, listen, you know what's going to happen. You're going to go. Now, you're going to drag this out. You're going to make me mad. I'm going to send you someplace you, want, you don't want to go. Would you rather go to the pit or the lake of fire? And the enemy literally spoke back and said, the pit. Why not? Why? Because the pit ain't painful. The pit is a holding place. Y'all ain't hear nothing I'm saying. Jesus gave the enemy a choice. He said, I'm casting you out. He said, please. Don't, don't send us where we don't want to go before our time. In fact, can, can, you're denying us access to this man. Would you please give us permission to go to those pigs? If you're going to make a dam, at some point, that water got to go somewhere. So if you don't have a place for that water to divert, what's it going to do? It's going to overwhelm the dam. It's not enough to bind. you got to loose. I bind you from my life, but I release you to the pit. you got to give them place. Y'all ain't hear nothing I'm saying. You kind of look at me like, No, you cannot have cereal at midnight. You can have an apple. No, you cannot have pancakes for every meal. you got to give them options. Christians, too often, too often we focus on everything that we can't do. Can I tell you, if that's what your focus is, you will forever be frustrated. I can't do this, and I can't do that, and I can't hang out with them people, and I can't do what I want to do, and I can't. This serving Jesus is difficult stuff. I'm sorry, did we forget what you can do? You can live in peace that you can't buy in a bottle, that you can't smoke, that you can't ingest, that you can't shoot up, right? You can have peace and joy and relationships that are built on the foundation of who he is. You can have, you can have illness-free living, disease-free living. You can have wisdom there's so many things that you can't, why are we focusing, why well, I can't have that car, and I can't have that house, and I remember years ago, my wife used to tell me, she said, I would rather live with you in a shack and be in love than to be in a mansion and can't stand each other. Amen. So instead of walking around going, I can't have that big old mansion, I'm celebrating the house we're living in because we're living in, y'all ain't hear nothing I'm saying. 
Listen to this. I saw a post recently that said this. Laziness kills ambition. Anger kills wisdom. Fear kills dreams. Ego kills growth. Jealousy kills peace. Doubt kills confidence. If you read it that way, the emphasis is on the negative. And you know the enemy is great at backmasking, right? He likes to take everything that's godly and pervert it by making it backwards. So if you take something good and make it backwards and it's evil, what if you take something that's evil and turn it backwards and see if it's good? Let's try it. Ambition kills laziness. Wisdom kills anger. Dreams kill fear. Growth kills ego. Peace kills jealousy and confidence kills doubt. We have to decide that we're no longer going to be influenced by little foxes, but they are going to come. We think that just because we made a decision, I'm not going to be influenced by them, that they're not going to show up. Oh, they're going to show up. And when do they show up? The moment you start producing. Ephesians 5.15. Therefore, see that you walk carefully, living your life with honor, purpose, and courage, shunning those who tolerate and enable evil, not as the unwise, but as wise, sensible, intelligent, discerning people making the very most of your time on earth, recognizing and taking advantage of each opportunity and using it with wisdom and diligence because the days are filled with evil. Therefore, do not be foolish and thoughtless, but understand and firmly grasp what the will of the Lord is. When there's a wheat harvest, the enemy is going to show up to sow tares. When the vines begin producing fruit, he's going to send out foxes. But you and I are making a decision tonight that we're going to catch the foxes. We're going to destroy the foxes. So let me tell you some characteristics really quick about the fox, and then I'm going to pray for you. The fox is a very peculiar animal. It likes to feast on grapevines. Watch this. It's silent and lonely. It has an incredible sense of sight, smell, and hearing. You guys catch what I've just said so far? Feast on easy food, is silent and lonely, and is very observant. It's also very clever in going after its prey. There's sometimes it'll play dead, so a bird will come in close proximity and he'll pounce on the bird. And when a fox is being hunted, it's very cunning, devious, and capable of misleading its pursuers with utmost skill. It's always been considered an emblem of slyness, craftiness, and mischief. So the fox is fast, slick, sneaky, watch this, adorable and cute. You got a family home, they starve to death. Daddy finds a a deer in the crosshairs. And mama's like, please don't kill baby's mama. Please don't kill baby's mama. Huh? Why? Because it's so cute. If cuteness will starve you, cuteness can be used to kill you. Don't be deceived by cuteness. We tend to underestimate the smaller things in life. Oh, I just had one argument with my wife. It was six months ago. She just got over it. No, she didn't get over it. She's still seething over that. And it's going to show up when I least expect it. Why? Because I didn't deal with the foxes. Y'all ain't hear nothing. Y'all pretending to be holy right now. Oh, yes, Pastor. The atom bomb was a small object, but it brought the nation of Japan to surrender in just minutes. A flea is very small, but enough of them can kill the largest dog. You know, big sins many times are easier to deal with than small ones. You ever get a big splinter in your finger? It's a lot easier to get out than that tiny one. And too often we give the attention to the big stuff and we ignore the little stuff. And the enemy uses the little stuff 
to undermine us and kill us. One more passage. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 6. Now these things, the warnings and admonitions took place as examples for us so that we would not crave evil things as they did. This book is full of examples of what to do and not to do and what happens when you do both. Learn from this instead of by your own experience, okay? Verse 7, do not be worshipers of handmade gods as some of them were. Just as it is written in Scripture, the people sat down to eat and drink after sacrificing to the golden calf at Horeb and stood up to play, indulging in immoral activities. We must not indulge in nor tolerate sexual immorality as some of them did. And 23,000 suddenly fell dead in a single day. We must not tempt the Lord, that is to test his patience and question his purposes or exploit his goodness as some of them did. And they were killed by serpents, verse 10. And do not murmur in unwarranted discontent. Now here's that, here's that phrase again. When the Lord spoke, I believe it was Job, and said, if you'll get rid of that mistaken tone of mistrust. And here we are again. And do not murmur in unwarranted discontent as some of them did and were destroyed by the destroyer. Now these things happened to them as an example and a warning to us. They were written for our instruction to admonish and equip us upon whom the ends of the ages have come. Therefore, let the one who thinks he stands firm, watch this, immune to temptation, being overconfident and self-righteous, take care that he does not fall into sin and condemnation. Oh, that's not a problem for me. I ain't never going to have that problem. Be careful where you stand, lest you fall. Verse 13, no temptation, regardless of its source, has overtaken or enticed you that is not common to human experience, nor is any temptation unusual or beyond human resistance. But God is faithful to his word. He is compassionate and trustworthy. He will not let you be tempted beyond your ability to resist. But along with the temptation he has in the past and is now and will always provide the way out as well so that you will be able to endure it without yielding and will overcome temptation with joy. All that to say, there's nothing happening in your life that God has not already equipped you to win. If you didn't know that a Firefox was not a real animal, this might really confuse you. How many has used this browser called Firefox by Mozilla? The real animal that the logo was created after was not this fox. This is an actual fox that's a cross between a red and a black fox. And so somebody looked at it and said, boy, that looks like a, that looks like a Firefox. And so they kind of dubbed it, but it's not an actual Firefox because there's no such thing as a Firefox. The actual animal that the logo of the Firefox web browser was created after is the red panda. And both the fox and the red panda have some very similar characteristics as to how they hunt and what they eat. But many times, people do not know the difference between real and and fake. I mean, for the longest time, there might be some people here today that still think that a unicorn is a real animal. Think about it. So many times we get real messed up because we can't discern the difference between what's real and what's not. There's been a lot of money and technology and effort that's been put into robots. How many aware of that? Japan has created a robot that looks and has all the physical attributes of a woman. And it is created now that it will cook, it will clean, it will do other things that women do. And it, they cost $40,000. And there are people lining up with their credit cards to buy that. Why? They're trying to get what they want cheap. I hear some of y'all, $40,000 ain't cheap. 
You want to look at what I spent on my wife? But we have people that, that are buying the lie that think, I don't need interpersonal relationships. I can buy a robot. Do you understand how warped that is? See, when Cameron and I were in college, we were kind of known as the campus mechanics. And we did things like brake jobs, radiators, um, and what we do? Uh, serpentine belts, alternators. You name it, just normal maintenance junk, right? We did that for people that didn't have the money or the expertise in order to do that. I mean, most of them were living out of state. They're far away from home. They break down somewhere. I remember one time we got called out. It was a lady that broke down on Northwest Expressway at the intersection, about four cars behind the red light, sitting there embarrassed as she lost all the coolant on the ground, right? And so Cameron and I needed some comic relief every now and again. And so we tell them, say, listen, you're really low on blinker fluid. I need you to run down to AutoZone and get me a gallon, okay? Okay, all right, I'll, be, I'll be right back. And they get back, and they're furious at us. Why? So you say, I can tell by looking at you, some of y'all don't know. There's no such thing as blinker fluid. <laughs> so now they're irritated and embarrassed, right? Some of y'all are going, I didn't know that. <laughs> There's no such thing as blinker fluid. I've seen, some, I've seen some Facebook posts said, have you bought your blinker fluid yet? And it shows a gallon jug says blinker fluid all over it. It's, it's not true. But this is what the enemy is trying to do to the inexperienced and the uninformed. The uncovered, the unprotected. The enemy wants you to think that you're doing what God wants you to do, like go to the store and buy a gallon of blinker fluid. When he knows it's going to frustrate you. And then you're going to wind up being upset, not at the devil. You're going to wind up being upset at God. God, why would you let this happen? Why am I so embarrassed? And why did they let that work? This is part of what pastors are supposed to do. When we hear somebody tell you, Hey, listen, you need to go buy a gallon of blinker fluid. We're like, sis, <laughs> don't do that. Don't do that. It's going to embarrass you. It's going to waste your money. It's going to waste your time. And it's going to empower them to do this to you again. And if they would lie to you now and tell you to go buy blinker fluid, what are they going to tell you to go buy next time? Do you see what I'm saying? So it's important that we take wise counsel. We need to work on discernment. Discernment is like any other muscle. You have to work it before it's going to get any bigger right? So how does that happen? Well, that happens in prayer. That happens in getting in the Word. That happens in spending time with God. That happens from hearing God. That happens from hanging out with people that walk in discernment. There's some things that are caught, not taught. It, it, that, that really does happen. So if you find that your discernment is broken, then find somebody in your life that discernment is not broken. If you feel like something's pinching you right between your shoulder blades and you can't see it and you can't grab it, then get somebody in your life who has access to see that and remove that thing that's biting you. Y'all hear anything I'm saying? We really do need one another. We've got to learn the difference between God's voice, the devil's voice, and our voice. We're going to have to learn the difference between a divine appointment and a demonic appointment. You know how many times somebody's come to me, man, I met somebody the other day. I just believe that's God. They show me a picture. Yeah, I'm sure you believe that's God. You hear what I'm saying? Listen to what I'm telling you. We have people pursuing people and jobs and money, and things, because they believe that God's in it, because it's what they wanted, and that God wants to give me the desires of my heart, so if God wants to give me the desires of my heart, then that's what I want, then that's got to be God, that their discernment's broken. We got to know the difference between God's call and our own desire. We need to know the difference between anointing and charisma. 
We definitely need to know the difference between true friends, excuse me, rather than wolves in sheep's clothing. Discernment is incredibly important. Can I say this to some of you that feel like discernment is active and alive in your own life? If you're only using it for you, it's broken. You say, well, how in the world can you say that? If you come to a church meal and I got the last plate and you came behind me and sat down and you have nothing, if I don't share with you, there's something broken in me. And if God has given me discernment for myself and I only use it for me and not you and not you and not you and not you, I'm broken. And hopefully one of you with greater discernment will come to my life and say, listen, I know that discernment thing is working for you, but bless God, man, you're called to these people. Use it for them too. The way the enemy destroys us is he gets us alone. And that's one reason why I'm super proud of this body, because you're reaching out and you're grabbing people that are, that are flailing in the water, and they're just about to give up and just let the current take them, and you're dragging them along and saying, come, come on over here, get your feet underneath you, let's get you dried off, let's get you some, some food and some water, some rest. We're going to go at this again, only we ain't going to go this solo, we're going to do this as a team. That's what the body of Christ is supposed to do, that's what we're called to do, that's, that's how we're called to be. We have to know the difference between a fake logo, watch this, and a fake Firefox. We got people that don't know the difference between a real gift and charisma. You got some well-dressed, fresh breath, cologne-enveloped, good-looking man or woman of God, and they come up and say, I just got a word for you. <gasps> And because they have their Hyundai's and Shundai's and barely, barely I say unto you and all that is worked out, you just, oh, that's got to be a word from God. Your discernment's broken. Guys, or sometimes people just say, listen, I just need to pray for you. Uh, no, you don't. Why? Because discernment works. Y'all ain't hearing this. You got to use it. I just don't want to hurt their feelings. Okay, go home with that devil they're releasing. I'd rather hurt your feelings than go home with the devil. So as you see growth happening here and in your life, fruit begins to come out because your root system is planted and you're beginning to produce. Don't be shocked when foxes show up. Yes, they may look cute. They might make little squeal squealy noises at you and act all lovey-dovey. and they're, they're suckering you real good because they're just trying to get close to you to get your fruit. So when somebody's in your life and says, Chris, there's a few foxes around you, bro. Better pay attention. Well, I don't see no fox. There's one, there's one. Oh, oh, them's foxes? Yes, them's foxes. <laughs> you catch what I'm saying? It's not enough that I stay free. What good is my freedom if you're not free? Never thought of it like this before, but I wonder how many people are living in such a way to see to it that they make heaven, all the while on purpose ignoring everybody else that's not making heaven. I wonder if that's enough to disqualify them when they get to the gates of heaven. He says, listen, there'd be 5,000 plus people behind you if you'd have done what I told you to do, but since you were all about you, that's selfishness. That's a new concept. I hadn't really thought of that one before. We're so busy about self-preservation that we don't understand that one of the best ways of self-preservation is to make sure that others are healthy too. Yeah. You want to find a healthy lawn? It's the lawns that have more grass than weeds because the thicker the grass is, the more it chokes out the weeds. Did y'all catch that? 
the thicker the vegetation in here, the more it chokes out the weeds. We got to have thick vegetation. For those of you that caught any portion of this stream, we celebrate the fact that you found us in whatever fashion or way that you did. I'm so grateful that you did. If you're looking for a church home, we'd love to invite you here to 2632 Southwest 39th in Oklahoma City. We meet Sunday afternoons at 2 p.m. every Thursday evening, Thursday evening at 6.45 p.m. Uh, we've got uh, Brad Flute coming, which we did not announce that yet, but he will be with us on the weekend of our anniversary, which is September the 7th. So I think it's going to be 5, 6, and 7, or 6, 7, and 8. I think it's 6, 7, and 8. So mark your calendars for that. We'd love to see you uh, here for that as well. So until our next appointed time, God bless you. Have an incredible day.